Thank you, all 10 of you, for being here. Um, so I'm Bob Cooney. This is my esteemed panel. And we are going to talk about, um, I'm just going to trust that you're there, because I feel like I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in a, an interrogation with those lights. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about location-based entertainment, and specifically, really, arcades, right? I mean, there's LBE, and, and there's a lot of confusion in this industry around what LBE means. I just signed up to chair the LBE committee for the VRARA, and the previous person that was in there thought it was about location-based services on mobile. And so I think that if any of you are not interested in actually the arcade business, this would be a good time. The bar doesn't open till 5, unfortunately, but um, you might be able to find a water fountain somewhere. Um, and so I'm going to give you just a really, really briefest overview of the industry, of where, it, where it's come from, where it is. I'm going to try to do it in about like 12 seconds. And then we're going to talk about the, the actual opportunities of where money is being made and can be made um, in this space. Because it's, um, you know, it started with HTC when um, they came out with Viveport Arcade. And they were the first company to really see that for VR to get going, they needed, people needed to try it and the place to try it was going to be in these pop-up entrepreneurial arcades that happened all over the world. And, um, and so they, they created a licensing model for entrepreneurs to buy equipment, go to strip malls, and open up arcades. And it's kind of a cottage industry. It's not really a viable business. Bill will talk a little bit about that, maybe. It's a challenging business, let's put it that way. Um, and, but a few years ago, we started to see this, um, this, this um, homogenation of, or, or coming together of um, VR companies making LBE solutions and amuse, traditional amusement operators that run things like Dave and Buster's and amusement parks and family entertainment centers. And those guys spend over a billion dollars a year in new attractions in the US alone. And so I started a, an event called the VR Arcade Game Summit to try to bring those two communities together so the VR companies could actually start making some money and selling to people who actually sold tickets. Um, and now most major arcade manufacturers, companies you've heard of like Sega, or Namco, Raw Thrills, um, which was owned by a guy named Eugene Jarvis, who created Defender back in the, in the 80s or 70s. He's not that old. He doesn't look that old, Chanel, does he? He, he looks great. He's like, he is yeah. ageless. Yeah. Um, those guys are all now making um, VR arcade games that are traditional VR cabinets, and they're using VR displays as the new display technology for arcade games. And that's continuing to penetrate the market. And you're seeing more and more of those going, going on. And so there's, there's two opportunities in the market today. And, the, and now the industry has labeled that unattended VR. Coming out of the pandemic, labor rates going up, um, couldn't hire and retain employees. So virtual reality attractions early on needed employees to attend them and help people into them. And so what they did is they kind of leaned towards this more arcadey model where, um, where you didn't need an employee to stand there and help people do it. And so that's an opportunity we'll talk a little bit about today. And then the other big category that I want to kind of talk about is free roam. The whole, the whole room scale, 10 by 10 Vive thing is kind of gone. It's dead. It's, it's, it's not space efficient. Um, it's not labor efficient. The games will I'll, I'll go through the top. I just went on to Springboard, which is the, the number one platform for content distribution and management in um, VR arcades. <laughs> And, um, and I picked up the top nine games on Springboard. Here we go. Number one, Arizona Sunshine, released in 2016. This is this month's statistics, by the way. Um, Elven Assassin, number two, released in 2016. Job Simulator, released in 2016, was number three. Skyfront, 2017. Private Property, new game from 2020. That was the first, um, the first one to break it. The, the, the new decade, Revolver 3 2021, Super Hot 2016, Creed Rise to Glory 2018, and After the Fall 2021. And so the average age of games in these VR arcades that are the room scale stuff is five and a half years. And so you can kind of get a sense that that market is kind of rotting like a tomato. Um, and so, but the other space where things are really happening is free roam virtual reality, right? Which is, you know, what we call co-location, where you have somewhere between you know, six and 12 or 20 people in a space with a tracking system. Now the tracking's gotten cheap and easy with all-in-one headsets. It's become really efficient. Zero latency is approaching 100 locations around the world. Sandbox has just opened, I think, their 40th franchise. Um, a company called HeroZone has over 200 locations. Johnny, how many do you have with Spree? Uh, open. 
uh, over 100 now yeah. operating. Yeah, so, um, and so the free roam market is growing. And I started one of the first laser tag companies in 1989. Um, and I see virtual reality, and there's still laser tag. There's 5,000 laser tag arenas in America, from best I can tell. And I see virtual reality now in free roam finally starting to replace laser tag. And there's a massive opportunity there. And so, um, and, and, and so I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a framework of the market, and we'll, we will take questions um, towards the end. And if anybody really has a pressing question, just um, don't raise your hand because I won't see you because I'm blind. But um, if you want to just like yell, I have a question, um, we can just pause and take questions interactively if that's OK with the ringmaster here. Cool. Um, so let's, let's introduce my panel. Bill, we have an operator. We kind of have a, I'm going to call Johnny a manufacturer, but he also has a, a game studio as well. It's kind of a turnkey solution. And within the industry, I kind of call those companies that sell these solutions solution providers. And then, um, and then Chanel's a game developer. And so, or game designer, game developer. And so we've got different perspectives. And what I want to do is tap into um, the, the three perspectives I think you have to understand to be successful in this market. And so, Bill, talk a little bit about your adventure in running um, uh, your arcade in Philadelphia, outside of Philly. Yeah, um, I opened up Senatech in 2016. So as Bob said, originally we were doing like the vibe. Um, we always had an open, we never did like the whole room thing. We were always like an open space. And the reason why we did that was because um, parents really want their kids. And we really leaned towards younger kids between the ages of probably eight to 14. And they really want their kids to play with other kids because right now all the kids are at home um, looking at the devices constantly, playing Roblox, Fortnite. So it was really a location where you could bring your kid and your kid was willing to go because it was VR. They wanted to try out VR. But they were all basically playing with other um, kids. That's why this VR arena, you know, VR arenas are really, um, it really works well with the moms where that's, the moms, they want two things. They want the kids to play with other kids and get exercise and learn. Um, so those are the three things like a mom wants. And the reason why I keep on bringing my mom is they're the ones paying the bills. So <laughs> they're the ones that want to pay $30 for a VR experience. Or $1,000 for a birthday party. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what we ended up really becoming, a birthday party center. We also became a big place for schools and camps to come in and bring in. Um, we, I mean, we would have schools coming in with 120 kids, like the whole third grade. And um, camps would come in with like 300 kids. So we really became a really, really big, successful place. Um, it actually closed last year, and it didn't close. I mean, we were pretty successful, and we had decent sales. The mall basically closed that part of the mall. And um, I've actually, I actually, um, like, I invested in a content developer, and I have other businesses, and my manager was quitting, too. So I was just kind of like, they wanted me to move to the other side of the mall. And, you know, it wasn't, and I always say I'm going to come back, but. And that was, was on the tail end of the pandemic, too, which yeah. shut our whole industry down for, like, and a lot of industries, obviously. Yeah, we too. came out, yeah, we, we came yeah. out of the pandemic, the mall, you know, forgot, forgot our rent, you know, and let us go on all the rent. And they were actually willing to pay us to move. We, we actually dealt with Simon Mall. They want us in every one of their malls. So it's not that I'm going to go back, but the whole idea is the industry's changing to free roam so much that I just decided, like, I don't want to go back to that individual location. Yeah. And I'm kind of waiting for. Free Realm does have problems with anchors, except for John. Not system. anymore. Like it's gotten, yeah. it's gotten so much better. We'll talk it, about it, the tech. It's a getting better. Bit like yeah. the company I own, we just we recently did something with Meta to try to fix their anchors in Free Realm. Yeah. Um. You know, we're kind of working on a secret project with them on. With these, yeah. Right, blah, blah, blah. Secret. But um. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Johnny, what's um? So talk a little bit about about Spree. What do you guys do and. And uh, yeah, where where do you fit in the market? Sure. So. Um, Thanks for being all here. So Spree um, previously was named Holodeck VR, so we're on the market already six years. Um, so we originally started with serving theme parks, um, but then we realized that these theme parks, obviously, they have, let's say, all custom desires. So we switched um, also with an investment from a TV broadcasting company in, in, in Europe to the more scalable FEC market, like Family Entertainment Center, um, mostly here in the US. And what we are providing is a whole catalog of games, which you see on screen, to free roam um, arenas. As Bob mentioned, it's um, multiplayer. So four to 10 players can play there, see each other's avatars, and um, have entertainment 
education or sports experiences. And essentially, we, throughout these six years, um, we became the world leader for both all family-friendly experiences, so targeting um, kids from six to 12 year olds and uh, selling mostly to trampoline parks um, with gated admissions. So basically, you have, for example, every hour 200 new users in, in your park, and then the operator wants to have a additional, more immersive, uh, more innovative attraction than just trampoline parks. So it is a space next to the trampoline. And um, so, yeah, it has, has been a... Um, quite interesting journey and um, we, we're on a growth path and this year in particular we're also um, moving um, to other target segments so not only kids but also teenagers and tweens and that's why we are also having a little um, announcement here today you later want to, you want to show the game you want to show it like, we'll give them some context yeah, of what it is we, we, we can, can show it. it it's it's we have uh, a video i haven't seen it exactly it is, is uh, one, one more. more this one this more. is this is cyber mosh mayhem cyber mosh mayhem uh, exactly uh, um, a little press alert went out today so we thought uh, why not um being here on, on the AWE to, to announce um, so it's it's not fully released it's just more preview so to say um, and uh, as mentioned, we are originally coming from more, let's say, the family-friendly, non-violent, which, as Bill mentioned, the moms really appreciate. Um, however, we've seen that some of the operators who, for example, have their venues in shopping malls are forced by the shopping mall operators to have opening hours like the shopping mall, for example, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or even 10 p.m. And at some point, the kids are just at bed. So it's, let's say, 6, 7 p.m., and then they're just teenagers uh, and, and, and tweens uh, at the shopping mall, and the operators ask us, hey, I love your, your kids' games, but I also have you know, uh, teenagers and, and, and older uh, target audiences, which have different tastes, of course. And that's why we said, okay, let's serve, serve the, the client needs. And um, basically, it's a, a sci-fi um, shooter um, in space and um, cyberpunk style, and I also just played it once, to be honest, in our showroom in Munich, okay. and if we go to the next slide, we can just have a little um, video, it's uh, live captured, and I think it has a... Um So we're pretty excited um, about this and um, the way we deliver content to our clients is in bundles. So we have a pack which is a critical mass of content for the family friendly segment and uh, which has two new titles every year and this, this one will be our second title in the shooter bundle. So we have a water pistol game, then this one and then um, Wild West uh, game which will be uh, coming out later this year. So this means three games in this category which is then worth for um, operator to look at and, and to see whether he wants to subscribe to the whole bundle or just to individual games. So one of the, one of the things that I think is really interesting is as the, and you guys are, you've been on Pico for a long time, you've just, are you, have you moved to HTC Focus 3 or? Um, yes, so um, there are pros and cons. So with our main it was a simple account, I don't, I don't need you to. Uh, actually, we, we're we're in the process. Okay, yeah. you're in the process. And so what what I think is happening in the space is um, is that Pico for the free roam space they were really good at um, and I love the guys at Pico by the way they were really good at customizing firmware um, for each individual solution provider right so they would be really responsive. Um, their engineers would be really responsive, and they would help companies get their product working in the market. And then what HTC has done with the, their new Focus 3 is they created this platform called Location-Based Services, um, LBSS, and, um, and what they've done is productized 
all of those things that Pico was doing manually and made it really a lot easier for companies to deploy free roam environments and multiplayer environments and, and tracking, or they've solved a lot of the tracking issues. And so, um, and so because of that, what I'm seeing is the vast majority of maybe 90 plus percent of the companies making free roam solutions are now kind of solidifying, on, standardizing on the Focus 3. And what that's doing then is, you know, Johnny mentioned bundles, is it's allowing content developers to really kind of less fragmentation, right, build games and then potentially bundle those games into genre-specific channels or age-specific channels or location-specific channels. And so you're, you're going to see that happening, I think, a lot over the next couple of years. Um, and I think, you know, I, think, I think Spree was on the forefront of that really early on, saying, we're just going to make games for 6 to 12-year-olds. And now you're, you've done that, you've led that market, and now moving up to the next market makes a lot of sense. And so how do you view the... I'm going to get to you in a second, Chanel. How do you view the, um, the, 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 the hardware-software abstraction? Because Paul mentioned at the arcade conference that you guys are going to be kind of abstracting the hard, hardware and offering software only to people that have their own hardware. What's happening in that space? Yeah, that's a good point, Bob. Um, there's an industry conference uh, called IAPA where basically almost all leads, almost all interested people in our games, they said, we love your games. However, and above all, North American market is the leader in this free roam space because there has been, let's say, a first wave of these VR attractions. Um, mostly with Hologate and they, or with Springboard, and they, they had the experiences with, with the hardware. And some operators, they actually they just want content. So uh, as Bob mentioned, these headsets are now getting, let's say, into, to a, towards a standard. So, and that obviously we, we see and we, we want to serve the, the needs of these operators. And that's why we start to uh, offer our games, the games libraries, which you saw, to also operators who prefer to buy their hardware on their own, um, which is completely fine. So, and we are delivering it just um, similar to a consumer yeah. experience. You download the, the game, you trial it if you want, and then you decide if you want to subscribe to it yeah. or not as a pay-per-play. And so, so what you're going to see is the, the companies like Spree or HeroZone, maybe even Zero Latency, um, are going to almost like, it's like a battle for the launcher, like you're seeing in the streaming services on TV. Um, and different content providers are going to be able to then, you know, license their software to different launchers. And each of them, I mean, you guys have some first party, a lot of first party content, but some third party content. And other companies have first, a combination of first and third party content. So if you're an indie game developer, you know, you could develop a free roam game for Focus 3 and have like a pretty good opportunity for distribution, which wasn't there probably until today. Um, and so that's one of the big opportunities. So speaking of game development, Chanel, you want to introduce yourself? Sorry for the delay. Oh, no worries. Thanks, <laughs> Bob. Um, hi, I'm Chanel Summers, and I've been in the game industry for over 20 years. Um, after a long career as a designer and producer of consumer video game titles at various companies ranging from Mattel to Microsoft, uh, where I was a member of the original Xbox product team. Um, I served as the vice president of product development at VR Studios, which was a company that really pioneered uh, location-based entertainment VR from uh, 2016 through the end of 2022. Um, while I was there, I led the uh, creative and technical development and the management of the company's entire portfolio of over 30 entertainment attractions for family entertainment centers, cruise ships, casinos, um, theme parks, and other out-of-home uh, entertainment destinations. Also, during those six years, we built the industry's first ever um, LBE to consumer linked title, and we designed and delivered the first successful LBE VR iteration in the Halo franchise for the Halo Outpost uh, Discovery Traveling Show. <clears throat> uh, that was for Hershen Entertainment and Microsoft 343 Studios. 
um, I conceived of and with my team delivered the first line of real sports VR sports titles, including Hoops Madness and Football Frenzy, which were well received by the industry. And I also oversaw the design and delivery of eight immersive VR titles for the proprietary motion simulator designed and operated by Dave and Busters in all their locations across the United States of America. Our titles, which were based on some of the most recognizable licenses in film and television, ranging from Star Trek to Terminator and Men in Black and Transformers and Top Gun Maverick, are among the most played LBE VR titles of all time. What else have you done? <laughs> Slacker. <laughs> um, so let's stay with you, Chanel. So, so what are, and by the way, um, Chanel and I and another game designer, Joe Mars, just did a webinar for the VR ARA, um, and it's entitled How to Make VR Games That Don't Suck. Um, and we've gotten really ridiculously good feedback from people who actually have made games for a long time, and so I'm sure if you Google that title, you'll find it. Um, and, uh, and it's probably worth watching if you're in game design or game development um, in this space. But what are, the, what are some of the things, you know, that, that developers need to do differently, like top three things that developers need to do differently when they're developing for LBE or arcades versus consumer games? Yeah, for sure. So in LBE, throughput is everything. So in you know, consumer gaming and the consumer uh, VR space where you're at home, sure you can make a game that has hours of gameplay. You can't do that at, the, at LBE, otherwise <laughs> the facility is not making money. Um, they need to get as many um, guests per hour into those systems as possible. So throughput is everything. And so for something like specifically like a VR, VR arcade experience, um, like, uh, you know, which, which is like more like a VR kiosk uh, experience, you know, you want something that's around three to five minutes. Um, the the uh, experiences we did for Dave and Busters, which were literally like AAA feature films, those had to be all done in like four to five uh, minute slots. Um, so throughput is everything, so timing, length of experience is number one. Number two, um, issues I've, I've seen when, we, when I've worked with um, outsourced developers is they've got all these very complex interface systems and they've got all these menuing systems. Again, that's fine for the consumer space where somebody's at home and they can take the time to figure things out and work that stuff out. Not so in um, a family entertainment center or some sort of LBE destination. That person has to be able to get in. That experience has to be intuitive, accessible. They gotta be able to get in the game and be able to get out of the game. And similarly to that, like the control scheme. The control scheme has to be very simple and intuitive. Can't be like, oh, th this, this button does this, and this trigger does this, but then the top button does this, but then sometimes it does this. Can't be like that. It's got to be very, very simple to use. Those are the top, top three. Yeah, yeah, cool, thanks. Bill, Bill as an operator, what are some of the things that, um, that drove you crazy <laughs> that you wish, you know, you could like developers to do differently in some of the games that you ran? Um, it has to be easy to use. I mean, like Chanel was just saying, real, like, like you mentioned earlier, Job Simulator, it's still the number one game because it's easy to play for someone who has never done VR. It also, you want to have a game that they'll come back and play again. So you don't want them just to come play the game. As she said, it has to be a few minutes and they're done. You want them to want to play it again. So it has to have like a beginning and end, but it also has to have like an achievement where they'll come back and they'll just keep on coming back over and over and over. Yeah, um, so, so you just hit on like one of the real challenges in the industry, which is it's gotta be simple to play and really hard to master, right? Yep. And so think of games like Tetris, Pac-Man, classic arcade games that are still out there today that anybody can start playing and having fun in the first 20 seconds, but you know, but there's a lot of depth to it. And so that's one of the real challenges in this industry. Bill, what were, what were, were, there, what were the games that, besides Job Simulator, that you saw that, that nailed that? 
Um, pretty much the ones you said. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why they're still on the top uh, ten list, It right? would drive my staff crazy that they would just come uh, come in and play Job Simulator over and over and hours and hours and come back the next day and play Job Simulator over and over and hours and hours. It's just it's just the way kids are, I guess. They just play the same games. They, what, what was it about that game that you think did, that had that stickiness to it? Um, because it had a lot of different things to do in it, you know, and so the more they played it, it was like, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, and the menu items would come up, so job simulator, like your chef, it'll have different menu items come up, and it did the same menu, menu items don't come up all the time, it's like, you do this, you do that, and, and, and then they'll just pass by stuff they did in the past, and they have other things to do, but then the time, job simulator is kind of like a free roam game where... Well, I don't know that's the right terminology, but it's, it's just... almost like a sandbox a game. A sandbox yeah. game. So you could do this, you could do that, you could do this, you know? Yeah. What, do you want to add anything to that, Chanel? Um, I, well, I, I want to say that, like, yes, for sure. You want to get people to keep coming back and, like, swiping, swiping, swiping. And a lot of that is, um, you know... It, it comes down to like getting people into flow or, you know, having a very strong core loop, you know, and the core loop is something that you do in that experience in that game over and over and over again. Um, it should initially be for, particularly for um, start out, maybe simple, and then you can add layers of depth to it as you sort of learn how to use that core loop. But a very engaging core loop is everything, and that's something that most developers and designers struggle with. Um, but that's what helps to put you into that flow channel. And that's that flow channel is where um, the guest loses all sense of their self, and all they do is think about the game. The game is ever important. So when the game stops, they have to get back into it. It's almost this addiction. Yeah, and games like Candy Crush nailed that, right? I exactly. Mean, great, best example of, and Farmville was the other one with yep. a great example of really good core loops. Angry Birds. Angry Birds, yep, there's another one. So, so, so Johnny, you've, you've had to do all of the things, right? You've had to figure out the hardware stack, you've had to figure out the software, the content library. Let's stay on the, let, let's, let's focus on the games a little bit, because I think one, and just full disclosure, I was on Spree, Spree's boards for, a long time for many years, and so I'm, I have been affiliated with them no longer. But um, talk about the games that you've done because you've taken a very different approach to game development than any other company in the space. Sure. Um, so essentially, when we started, we um, saw a market opportunity to focus on kids and. Uh, our first client was the biggest theme park in Germany, and they did originally VR on roller coaster rides. And there, basically, they did 80 upgrades. So we saw that and their sick kids from six years on was, were allowed to go in. And also, he, uh, Bill also mentioned that his target audience were kids. And we saw that kids were very adoptive. So we had a hackathon, and then kids from our developers would try VR, and they would love it and that's how somehow yeah one thing with another matched and then we saw that there were not many games out there for kids and then we thought okay what do what do kids actually need in order to have fun and we saw that um, it's specific uh, experiences for example one is a splatoon type game where you um, color a canteen with different colors it's a team based game uh, lemon versus tomato, and you're a canteen robot, and you're actually, um, as, as robots, you're kind of uh, fed up by humanity that you have to serve humanity, and you, you want to just have fun in the, in the canteen. And we... we let's, let's hope how that play, that's how that plays out. <laughs> and then, basically, um, we came up with the idea to, okay, uh, skip the controllers, just because we saw that the kids, they have a lot of energy, so they were running around, and um, it would have been, yeah, just too time intense to, to teach them, let's say, the controllers with different buttons, um, and then we focused mainly on gazing. So with, with the interaction of gazing, um, it's very intuitive, and then in this game, um, you actually would just look around the canteen and uh, color, um, wherever you look at and 
Yeah, for the target audience, six to twelve year olds, that was a that still is a very very appealing game, where you know you walk around this uh, canteen, which is um, always generated um, in a new fashion. So you have some variants there, and you have some power ups and stuff. But the core mechanic is actually to color the the canteen, the surface, and also overcolor the the um, colored surface from the opposing team. So pretty simple game um, and still um, um, high up in our, um, let's say, most played games. And yeah, based on, on, on these games and these experiences, we then deliver, de delivered a couple of other experiences. For example, one is a jumping game where we just uh, also no controllers, but we use the height of the um, of the user, so we obviously know that. And then we incentivize to jump on worms, like a whack a mole style game. Also very simple and um, very active, which the kids and the, the parents love. So um, depending, and kids usually they're completely in the game, so they would run for life, <laughs> actually. And um, yeah, that's fun to, to experience, and um, so this is, Basically, how we then created a um, um, critical mass of games in this uh, genre. Um, um, yeah, so that's yeah, and and I think they have another one which is which is you're an anteater and you have to swing your trunk to catch bugs. And so you see these kids walking through, and a big part of the industry is spectation. And so one of the challenges in um, in VR is it doesn't make other than some crazy TikTok videos of people crashing into their televisions, um, it doesn't really make for a very interesting experience to watch. And so one of the challenges when you're de designing these attractions or games is think about mechanics that will be interesting for passers-by because the, one, of the, one of the jobs of the product is to convert viewers to players. Right? And so, because there's nobody there grabbing people and pulling them in, unless you go to the mall and you see those like egg simulators where the hawker's there, the same person that's trying to give you like lotion samples. Um, and so, so that's one of the challenges. And one of the things I think you guys have done is when you see a bunch of kids jumping like this or swinging their heads back and forth, it makes people stop and be curious. And one of the more successful genre, product genres in the unattended space is VR Rabbids. Um, and Kong VR, which are simulators, and what they did is they created these hand tracking, they use leap motion, and they have these hand tracking mechanics where you have to swat at bugs, and so you walk by and you see people with headsets riding a simulator going like this, and people are like, what the hell is going on? And it makes them stop and pay attention. And so I think those, those, those mechanics that are fun to watch and make people stop are really important. You guys have done a good job. Yeah, Chanel. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, Two things. So, you know, when you mentioned simulators, that was, you know, one of the sort of um, pillars or design things we were given by Dave and Buster's when we were doing that. That um, even if in the game it looked like things should be just sort of a little bit more like, you know, steady, they were like, you need to make some kind of movement because that game is as much for the guests inside as it is the guests outside. So they wanted us to make sure that like when people are looking at the Dave and Buster simulator, that they saw this like really big like motion platform that looks like a Batmobile moving around, doing all sorts of like, you know, almost roller coastery type stuff. Um, the other thing too, is when we did um, uh, Football Frenzy, um, an arcade football game for self-attended kiosk VR. Um, one of the things that we really designed into that was the spect uh, spectator um, engagement. And that was, is that we made the spectator view have different like camera angles. We made it like ESPN. So we would have people come by, and we had sportscasters broadcasting stuff um, through the machine, and um, all the different like graphic overlays of what was going on. And so people would like go buy beers. So the facility is like making money on like you know food and beverage, and they go and they'd stand and watch people playing, which was very active because people would like move back, throw the football, 
and then of course you've got like the the sportscaster aspect and the ESPN aspect. So they're like standing around with their buddies, like drinking beers, watching it, you know, as if they're watching a real like game, you know, from like you know Thursday night or Sunday night or Monday night football. Yeah, cool. Bill, Bill, your place was. Yeah, and from an operator's perspective, so there's this narrative that VR is not for kids. A lot of the headset manufacturers put 13 and over labels on it, and that was all driven, obviously, by lack of long-term research and, and liability for big, big public corporations. Um, and so, you know, but we're seeing, and mostly for long-term use, right? I mean, in an arcade, you put on a headset. How long are your games, Johnny? Uh, indeed, pretty short, on like average, three to five minutes. Three to five minutes. And so, you know, the risk of any kind of long-term exposure damage for something in three to five minutes is minuscule, if, if, if at all. And so, um, what, what was your experience with kids in VR? Because I do think that when you're talking about arcades, birthday parties are a massive market in this space. You know, there might be a hesitancy by people to develop VR games um, for kids. What's, as an operator, you watched it. How many parents and kids did you say come through there? Like, what would you say to people? Well, the parents were never concerned. <laughs> to be honest with you, because the VR made their kids more active. They see their kids are sweating. They see, I remember at Sanitech, we actually had a mom that was bringing, it was like she was bringing a kid into the gym. She was coming in every day, and she told us not to tell a child, and you, I saw the kid get thinner. He was like this little chubby kid, because well, he was like a big gamer and he loved VR, and he would, they would play like Creed all the time, and the kid would just like be. She literally was using us like a gym membership. Um, we used to sell memberships, so she we, she overused the membership. <laughs> but they were coming in, especially if you got to pay like Springboard. Um, I know you guys are content creators, so somebody like Springboard or Synthesis, you get paid per minute when people play your game, so it, you can make a lot of money if you have a very successful game. Um, the other thing I know is kids like to play games. Um, I know she was talking about football, but a lot of it's things they can't do in real life. So if you're going to create a game, I'd recommend it's like you're going to you're going into time, or you, it's something you can't do in real life. Um, it, it just seems that the kids really lean into that Fan fantasy fulfillment. The kids play make believe all the time, right? So I, yeah, I totally agree with yeah. that. But uh, one story I want to bring up that was really amazing is is um, at uh, the Dave and Buster's Dallas. I met this um, mom. Um, whose child was, he would play constantly football frenzy and, and just absolutely loved it. And I said, hey, do you play football in school? And he goes, no, I play every sport but football because my mom won't allow it. And this is my only way to experience being able to play football. And that was amazing. That was amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about accessibility and we talk about, you know, accessibility in what is the traditional terms of you know, of, of people not having access to the things that we all take for granted, but there's a lot of opportunity there for people like that to be able to take advantage of things that, you know, we don't think about accessibility in that, in that term. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. I want to take some questions. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, cool. Um, when you say there is minimal risk for kids under 13 because the experiences are short in like three, five minutes, um, that, do you think that's actually true? Because if you want the kids to come back all the time and you want to keep them coming back, don't you think there is actually long-term risk due to being exposed to those short experiences constantly? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely no, so no. Um, there's absolutely no physiological um, cumulative effect. And so the only studies, the American Ophthalmological Society has come out and said, zero risk, period, right? And they did that in 2018. Um, the only long-term studies that show any kind of suggestion there might be something are military studies where people are in it all day long. Um, and so, but there's no, it's like if you read, you know, I use glasses, I read without my glasses, I'm not supposed to, I read for 20 minutes, I put my glasses on, oh, it's a little blurry for another 10 or 20 minutes and it adjusts back. And so there's, there's zero evidence and I have, I'm not an ophthalmologist, I have, but I have talked to them and I've researched it and there's no evidence whatsoever that suggests that it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah, a good question. Yeah, actually, um, I spoke to um, a top ophthalmologist about this and he told me, you know what the worst thing is for kids? Reading. He said that actually, people don't realize that, but reading for more than an hour is very bad for your kid's eyes. But he's never heard of a mom tell the kids to stop reading. But if you ever look, a lot of kids that read, what do they have? The biggest glasses. 
So he actually told me that, that's a little like, they know that, that reading, and he says with anything, you need to take breaks. So if you're gonna do VR, you know, don't, you know, just like reading, he, you know, they, if they wish the parents would make the kids take a break from reading, um, but it's about taking breaks. And, and luckily, the you know headsets like the Quest battery dies fast enough before you actually can stay in it for too long. So hopefully that continues. Um, any other questions? Come on, come on! Don't make me keep asking questions. My questions are going to get really stupid here in a minute. <laughs> All the way in the back. Great, thank you, Nicole. Oh, Nicole Lazaro. For those I haven't met from Zio Design. Hey, okay. So uh, I was questioned for the panel. Uh, what do you see in the, the LBE space that uh, works, what kinds of games work uniquely well that don't work, say, in uh, like a, like a home-based home, a home -based environment? Or where are the, the opportunities for new types of games? Thank you. Free roam. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole beauty of... Um, of LBE is is that you can have a, a big environment to move around in, and that environment can be custom designed, and you could have like different like props and tools that you can use. Um, so you know, being able to have that that space and being able to have those shared experiences in the in the in the physical space and being able to have those social experiences in the physical space. Those are the things that that you wouldn't be able to get um, at home. So yeah, to add to this, um, of course, uh, the experience needs always to be some, some drastic enhancement of what, what you could do at home in order to justify, obviously, uh, to pay for that and to go there. So either it is uh, a simulator, or in our case, with a VR playground, it is the sheer size and the social aspect that tend people can play together and you don't have to worry about buying 10 headsets and maintaining and, and so on. Um, plus we have other products like virtual reality bumper cars where you're physically in a bumper car and you have the motion of the bumper car plus a virtual overlay or augmented overlay and that is for example one, one attraction or one experience which you obviously cannot have at home unless you're a billionaire have your own bumper car set up at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at home, kids sit with VR a lot, and when they're out in LBE, they're basically standing, they're moving. So definitely the exercise aspect of it. And I think moms see that. Um, as I said earlier, definitely the parents realize that, you know, they, they get them the, the quest at home, they're just sitting on the couch playing games. A lot of consuming games you can play sitting down, but in, in the LBE space, you're standing. Um, there's not many LBE. I'll be a place and, and have a sitting experience. And that's really good for like these new like pass through uh, games as well because there's some really cool like um, home pass through games um, that have come out and are coming out and they're really cool. But just imagine having something more where you are not limited by that space and you're not having to move your furniture and you're not still like, oh, I just still bumped into my piano and oh, I, how do I manage and navigate the stairs? So. That, that space where you're not limited by. And then, as I said again, like the, you have the social experiences. Like, what if you want to do this with 10 of your friends? You can't quite do that at home, you know, moving the furniture and having this like two meter by two meter space at home. And then being able to have competitive and team based experiences. This is all what LBE offers you. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm I'm holding an esport event down in um, Dallas on June 21st at a place called Eva Esports Virtual Arena. It's a 20,000 square foot facility with two 5,000 square foot 10 player free roam arenas, and it's all competitive esports. So it's literally like going in and playing CS:GO um, using Focus 3 and Wi-Fi 6E streaming in a big freaking space. And so I think the competitive piece is something we're starting to see too, where people can come out and build community and meet together and play against their friends. And I think that's going to be a big trend in the next couple of years. I knew you had a question. I could tell. Hi, I'm uh, John Lee, Meow Wolf. We run and operate location-based entertainment company. But more focused on art and immersive experiences than anything, we are thinking about gaming. 
given this discussion, who would you say is doing exactly what you guys all talked about the best out there? Well, Johnny's going to be sweet. Johnny's going to be he Jeff. Sold. Huh? He sold his facility. <laughs> no, that was Bill. When you say, you mean from an operation standpoint? No, from a total. Who's nailed it? I love Brent. I really do. He's like a brother to me. I'll let you guys go, and then I'll, I'll go last if that's all right. So uh, your question is, who, who has the best overall location-based VR experience? So I think, I mean, you, you, you cannot, it's not as easy answered. It all depends on who's your target audience. So for example, our setup is meant for high throughput, quick experiences. And I would say we're the world leader in that aspect. However, there are obviously other players who have longer experiences, deeper immersion, high ticket price, and their Sandbox VR is, is a good example of a successful player. So, and, and then it also depends, do you operate it on your own or do you just sell the attraction to operators uh, where also different business models? Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is hard to answer that. I'll do it anyway later, but go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was gonna say a lot of operators like Dave and Busters, they do their custom applications. Um, you know, I work for a company, I mean, I'm part investor of a company where we do a lot of custom applications. Um, and then there's like, you know, Spree's great, there's zero latency, and there's a lot of great, um, Holligate, there's a lot of choices out there. So it really depends, like, for me, I will probably do, you know, a custom application. I think you're talking more, but like, like, mm -hmm. who's got the whole package, right? Who's really... We'll, we'll be the operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would I would have said VR studios until they like went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I think there's I, I've 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 flown I don't know two million miles in the last seven years trying VR location based VR stuff. So I've got a really broad perspective there. There's a company in Belgium called the Park Playground that I'm really big fans of. They have about 15 locations in Western Europe um, and they're growing fast. And what they do is they sell a 60 minute curated experience. So you come in. You, um, you, you, you go to a little cafe, then you do kind of like these little room scale single player experiences to get your VR legs. Then they take your group and you do a Richie's Plank experience, which was really social. Then they move you down to a free roam arena, thousand square feet, and you play about a half hour game. They have a broad library of games. So they're doing a really good job of, of understanding the consumer experience and the whole journey from the time they get to discovery all the way time to leaving and returning. And so they're really sophisticated. It was started by the guy um, who was the head of Uber in Belgium. And so he's got a real good mind for startups and automation of labor and this are really interesting things. I think 2-Bit Circus has done a wonderful job. I really do. Um, I, think they've, I think they've been a bit under attraction. I think they're really struggling with the, the attraction mix, how to get more games in there to what Brent would say, shoulder to shoulder play. And I think they're still trying to figure out that mix. I don't think they would tell you that they've nailed it. Um, You move from by. It's more. It, it's more immersive than it is VR, though, right? Yeah, I think they're starting to head that way. Yeah, um, I'd say Dreamscape did a, a fantastic job. Like their their whole consumer experience was remarkable. Um, you know, the the theming in the lobby and and the way they went through the whole experience. So, but but I I think you know one of the challenges we have as an industry is finding the uh, the reason it hasn't exploded is because nobody's actually figured it out yet. There is no model that you can say, if I put this and this and this together and I do this in this location, I'm going to be able to do it over and over and over and over again. And, and I think that that's part of, it's still in a really this experimental phase. Yeah, I think it's actually keeping up with the hardware. I mean, the hardware is changing so much. And I mean, for the better. And, but then you run into, it, you know, like free rooms, pretty new. Well, back know, still workouts, kinks. You and, know. and when you opened, how much, did, how much equipment did you, what was the cost of the equipment in your place? Like it was... Hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars, yeah, right? Yeah, like each station is like ten thousand dollars. Now you can get by Quest for, you know, yeah. one ninety nine. <laughs> but so, the, so the hardware, the hardware depreciation is less of an issue today yeah, than it was five years. When Zero Latency started selling it in twenty seventeen, it was seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know, now they're selling a, a, a system for, you know, a third or a quarter of that. And so, I do think you'll see more experimentation because the costs are coming down. But yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody's really. Involved. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. Yeah, and the other thing with LBE is like, do you like, do you want it to be a, um, a ride, or do you want it to be like a destination? Like when I was in Cenotech, we were getting a lot of schools coming in. They were more coming in for the experience. 
So it's really, you know, are, are you just like, are you competing with the, you know, like the other arcade machine in there? Or are you bringing people, like the schools were coming in for what we were offering an experience. They weren't coming in for VR, they were coming in for what we were offering an experience. Yeah. One more question before this next crowd comes in and takes over. Anybody else? I'm gonna give this guy a second shot. All right, there we go. Um, as an arcade operator, I'm really tired of VR shooters. I think there's enough. Um, and as an arcade operator, especially in the US, uh, there's a real concern for gun violence, of course, and also in other countries that it's also raising, like Brazil and other countries in South America. Um, so one of our one of my main focus right now is just diversifying the portfolio so that I don't have as many because the parents oh, get concerned as, as well, and it's a very valid concern, especially on how much it influences the kids. Okay, that's, a, that's an editorial, not a question. Sorry, yeah. So um, what other genres would you recommend that has worked in your locations for other VR operators? Well, I was just going to say, that's why, you know, I mean, we wanted to do things like sports games. So we, you know, VR Studios, when it was around, one of its biggest philosophies was active, skill-based games. Quick answers, quick answers. And, we so, all and so sports games, you know, things that weren't shooting, things that, like, were intuitive and natural and athletic. Things they use with their hands, cooking games, job simulator, that, that, that type of stuff, and um, puzzles. Educational games, like uh, where kids learn something in a gamified way. Yeah, I would say that one of the companies I didn't mention is a company called VR Cave. They have almost 200 locations with VR escape rooms. The first VR escape rooms weren't puzzly enough, but the, the, the game developers have figured out how to make them better and more puzzly so you can have escape rooms and play in fantastic places. And the last thing I'll say, offer as a counterpoint is, I know there's too many zombie games, but that's what people want to play. And ultimately, you got to sell tickets. All right, and if you're not selling tickets, if people aren't swiping their card, everybody's out of business. And what overwhelmingly, the number one most popular game for every single platform out there that offers it is a zombie shooter. And as much as we don't want it to be that way, that's the reality. So, yeah. All right, well, let's clap it up for our panelists, show. A very uh, insightful and invigorating deep dive into LBE. Um, so, yeah.